Good afternoon, good evening, good morning from wherever you are. I'm Iman al and I would like to welcome our audience and speakers to our fifth IEEE Women in Engineering UKI Ambassadors Program Early Career Talk. So I would like to mention that the presentation recording will be broadcasted on IEEE section uh, Region 8 YouTube. Uh, please provide your email in the evaluation form if you want to receive your e-certificate, which will be received after four days. Before we start, here are some housekeeping notes. You will notice that you are muted and cannot use your camera. So if you have any questions, please do type them into the Q&A chat box and we can address this at the end of the four presentations. So, and I'll share with you, this is the suggested agenda. Um, and then I'll hand now to Dr. Nagam Saeed to open this webinar talk. Thank you, Iman. Hi, I'm Dr. Nagam Saeed, the IEEE Women in Engineering uh, United Kingdom and Ireland Steering uh, Committee member. And also I'm the early profession uh, lead work group. I would like to welcome and thank everyone joining our ambassador's fifth event of the Early Career Talks program. A warm welcome to our speakers and our audience from all over the world. Uh, as I always say, this workshop is a unique experience to witness short talks about recent development in technology from industry point of view and research from academic point of view. Today talks that tackles different technical and engineering subjects such as Internet of uh, Things, uh, cybersecurity, fiber optics, robotics, image processing. Before we start the session, I would like to mention that this year, on the 8th of March, the International Women's Day, we celebrate the Ambassador Scheme first anniversary. Indeed, it was a year full of events, activities, and struggles to not only promote women in engineering and technology, but also to create a culture uh, a, a culture of diversity and inclusion and accepting it as a norm um, rather than an exception. Uh, we envision a vibrant community of IEEE women and men collectively using their diverse talent to innovate for the benefit of humanity. Hence, our ambassador scheme is continuously striving to bring this uh, future sooner. To reflect on how we uh, progressing to reach our goals, we put together a video summing up the ambassador's uh, past year's event, which we you can find in our YouTube channel. I will share the link in the chat shortly. Apart from our aim, the uh, main goal of globally uh, diversity in science, technology, mathematician, mathematics, uh, computing, and engineering, our events also aim to expose the audience to novel area and aspects of engineering and computing, which solves real world problems, establishing a link for industrial collaborations, networking and mentorship, and create connections for future research opportunities. Last year, we organized four early career talks to provide engineers from industry, recent PhD graduate, and postdoctoral researchers a free platform to share their work. Today, we are delivering the fifth episode of the series of this ongoing program. There were also two main events for promoting a diverse industry academia collaboration titled the Challenges and Opportunities Towards Better Women in Engineering Future and Empowering Women in Triple Helix Model. All our events included a variety of topics and the speakers represent representing men and women from academia and industry. We are grateful to the sponsors, speakers, and attendees of events for making them a success. I'm looking forward to listening to today's talks and enjoying a fruitful discussion. Last point before the start, we prepare a feedback survey for you to follow after the talks, which kindly Iman, the co-author for this event, will put in its URL in the chat box later. Without further ado, we will start our event with our first speaker, Gabriella. Please, Gabriella, start sharing your screen. Can you see it? 
Yes, we can. Uh, thank you, Iman, Dr. Ted. Uh, firstly, I would like to, uh, to thank the IEEE Women in Engineering and the UK, UK and Ireland section for giving me the, this opportunity to present my research. Today, uh, my topic is IoT cybersecurity, focus, focusing in one specific technology, narrowband IoT, which is part of my PhD research work. Uh, before I start in my presentation, uh, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, so um, I am currently doing my PhD at the Science Foundation Ireland from the Center for Advanced for Research Training in Advanced Networks for Sustainable Societies Advanced ERT, based on University College Core in Ireland. Previously, I completed my Master of Science at Brunel University London in the UK in Computer Communication Networks. And also I completed my engineering in electronics and networks at the National Polytechnic School in Ecuador. I've been involved in the telecommunication industry as well. My experience includes five years working with the mobile operators, which provides uh, telecommunication services in America as a part of the core network and the engineering team. Uh, my research interests uh, include the security issues for the wireless IoT, networking architectures, uh, privacy and ethics. So uh, today I will uh, talk about my recent work on MBI cybersecurity. To start, I would like to uh, briefly introduce some definitions about IoT cybersecurity in a general way. Then I will introduce the narrowband IoT as a technology on which we carry uh, out our simulations in our research. And then I will present the proposed scenario uh, under attack uh, through or jamming attack of the synchronization signals in MBI IoT followed with by, by questions, uh, conclusion questions and answers. Uh, so um, when we talk about uh, IoT, it is by, defini by definition a technology that provides an integration uh, of several sensors and objects that can, can communicate directly with one another without any human interaction. Nowadays, IoT is changing everything in the world we live the way we drive, the way we take care of health, and, the, and even when how we make decisions. Internet of Things include a number of sophisticated sensors, actuators, and chips embedded in the physical thing that, and, that are around us. These things are connected together and exchange huge data between them and with another digital component without any human intervention. IoT contributes uh, significantly to enhance our daily lives through many applications that come from, uh, from different sectors, such as smart cities, smart buildings, healthcare, smart grids, industrial manufacturing, and one others. Uh, currently, uh, one of the issues of the I uh, IoT is the privacy, privacy and security of the exchanging and, and the collected data that are often deeply uh, linked, linked uh, to the end user's life. For this reason, the IoT technology have to address security and privacy concerns uh, in order to be implemented uh, in a successful uh, way. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, here I, will, I would like to show you some relevant statistics about IoT. By uh, 2026, we will have more than 26 billion connected IoT devices, uh, which represent a huge opportunity, but also it, it, it brings a, a huge risk. With this, con uh, with this um, precedent, uh, we have some security questions uh, arising. How do we keep billions of IoT devices secure? How do we make them, uh, the data from those devices uh, is not compromised? And as the number of uh, IoT devices grow, the security vulnerabilities and the risk of the large scale cybersecurity are increases uh, exponentially as well. So now when it comes uh, to IoT, the security requirements uh, are unique. We should consider that connecting devices is different to connected people. For example, uh, in order to verify its identity, an IoT device cannot simply enter a password as a personal will do, similarly with the software and the update. In response to this, uh, some states and nations, in, uh, including the US and the, U the UK, have started to create regulations and, and standards uh, to protect, protect the IoT communication. Uh, just to mention a few, 
uh, in February 2019, the European Telecommunication Standard Institute, ETSI, released the ETSI uh, TS100-3645 in order to uh, provide the standard for security IoT products. products. Uh, in the same way, uh, the National Institute of Standard of Technology, the NIS, in the US, created the guidance 800 uh, 160 in order to implement security for Internet of Things devices. The guidelines include uh, the key requirements for, of any IoT technology, like uh, devices and data, data security, authentication for identities, uh, confidentiality, and integrity of, of the data. So uh, now I would like to talk about uh, some IoT security factors uh, that are impacting the IoT security. First, we will consider that critical decisions related to industry safety and health are increasingly based on data. So provide and make the right decision. Uh, in order to make the right decisions, data must be critical, must be accurate and secure. And next, the heterogeneity of the IoT uh, in IoT networks is critical because some devices are constrained uh, with very limited, limited capabilities. Uh, uh, for such devices, traditional security methods are not possible to issue. And finally, we consider that IoT networks are usually developed in a collaborative way. So uh, we have different providers, different manufacturers, and uh, different app uh, developers. So ensuring the end-to-end -end communication in this ecosystem is crucial. Uh, now I would like to briefly explain how to uh, build a trusted uh, IoT system. Uh, first, considering that, considering that uh, IoT uh, has a number of connected devices, which is growing exponentially, identifying each device becomes critical and complex. And we need to guarantee suitable devices identification to the connectivity uh, and in the application level. We have already mentioned the trusted data, but just to emphasize that in the data-driven uh, networks, data needs to be protected in transit, transit to preserve the data security, the data integrity, the confidentiality, and the availability of the information. Regarding the, confidential, regarding the privacy and confidentiality, we will, we will be aware that personal information can be extracted for analyzing an IoT device data. So at this point, I have talked about uh, some all of these consideration. Everything mentioned up to here is relevant for any IoT technology, including LoRa, Zigbee, or MBIoT. But in the next bits of my talk, I will focus on this resilient topic, especially focusing the narrowband IoT, and particularly I will talk about the resilience against uh, interference. So let's move on to Internet of Things. Um, so a brief introduction, introduction about uh, MBIoT is that uh, it's a technology uh, which is part of the LP1 radio technologies that aims to support a large number of low cost, low energy consumption, and low data rate devices operating in a large uh, coverage area. It is increasingly seen as the preferred future technology because it's deployed in the over the legacy in, as a part of the existing LTE legacy technology and it used a, a licensed band. However, its privacy and security have yet received less research attention. Uh, now I will talk about, about, uh, about the physical um, la layer because we, are, we need some definitions for in order to understand the following sections. So in figure one, um, you can see the MBIoT downlink and physical channel. As you can see, these are long based on the legacy LTE principles. And just to mention, mention a few, for synchronization, we have the narrowband primary and secondary synchronization signals. Uh, for control data, we have the narrowband physical broadcasting channel, the narrowband physical downlink control channel, and the narrowband uh, reference signals in the downlink. And for data transmissions, we have the downlink, downlink and uplink shared channels. In figure two, we, we, I want to explain some important concepts because um, this is the thing that we research is based on. Um, in the downlink, the concept, concept of physical resource element um, is used for specifying the mapping of the physical channel and signals into resource element. So the resource element is the smallest physical channel unit with, with a unique identification. So we have a, a subcarrier index K and a symbol index L uh, within uh, each 
uh, physical resource element. So in total, we are going to have like eight, uh, eight, 84 resource element per uh, re a physical resource block. So now I, I go in through this uh, or uh, attack the examine of narrowband synchronization signals, which is our proposed solutions solution. Uh, in our research, we describe uh, how interference on the narrowband and primary and secondary synchronization signal, the initial part of the communication can be used to implement, implement an effective denial of service. The significant thing about interference with the synchronization signal is that not only it prevents the communication between the UE and the base station, it only um, allows an, an attacker to force a device to connect with a specific base station, which a, is an spoofing attack. So here I would like to uh, present uh, how the MBIOT uh, connects, connects uh, with a base station. The random access process, uh, which I'm going to describe now, I only going to describe the synchronization part, which is the thing that we are going to use in, in our research. When an MBIOT device becomes active, uh, it synchronizes with a base station to establish a communication link. First, the UE needs to identify a suitable cell to attach to. And then for this purpose, they interchange the narrowband and the, the primary and the secondary synchronization signals in order to use it by uh, perform the time and synchronization and the time and frequency synchronization, cell identity detection, and the acquisition of the frame infrastructure information. After this step, the UE obtains the master information block, which is carried by the a physical broadcasting channel, and it carries and it provides the scheduled information from the uplink and the downlink data channel. Then the random access procedure continues and where several mes messages are interchanged in order to obtain parameters that allow the connection establishment. Well, uh, now with this old background, we now I want to present how our jamming attacks works. Uh, the primary and secondary synchronization signal are designed to allow uh, that, that the MBIOT uh, device use an, a unified detection algorithm during the initial acquisition of the narrowband physical cell ID. So how the narrowband physical cell ID detection algorithm works? First, it is defined as a correlation algorithm using the primary and secondary, second, uh, and secondary synchronization signals to determine a peak correlation magnitude. This algorithm defines these parameters as the sum of the peak of a correlation magnitudes from the time domain in the primary detection and the secondary domain in the in the frequency in and, and the frequency and, and the detection of the frequency in the secondary detection. Adding or jamming attack um, signal have the effect that the correlation algorithm is a still is a still a, able to produce a result but the defining narrowband physical cell ID is incorrect. Our jamming attack can be applied not only in the synchronization signal without the need to continuously jam the entire uh, transmission uh, channel. Our simulation fully decodes, uh, the modulates and uh, decodes the MBIOT downlink signal. Um, briefly explained, a time domain wafer of the RMC is generated for the narrowband physical broadcasting channel and then we introduce a, dam a dammer signal generated using a downlink 4G RMC waveform, where we can adjust the signal power. And the resulting signal received by the UE is the sum of the generated signal obtained from the base station plus our jamming signal. Um, so um, now I would like to point out some interesting results in, in our research. If, if the power of the interference signal is above 13 dB, a successful, successful uh, modification of the narrowband physical cell ID is observed. For an, our experiment, it is observed that um, the power of the jammer is, is insufficient. The communication without the specific inode V is inhibited because the UE is not able to decode the MIP and get the scheduled information. So as you can see in figure four, uh, we have the scenario A, which shows the transmission uh, signal without our jamming attack. Here, the cell ID is accurately, accurately detected. Uh, we have uh, the cell ID 120, which is the right cell that we want to detect, and the MIP is correctly decoded. 
So at this point, the MIV, the master information block parameters, um, can is able to extract the narrowband cell ID, the narrowband reference signal, the number of soft frames, the hyper soft frames, the operation mode, and another control information. And in a scenario V, in contrast with the first one, uh, it shows that the signal under jamming attack were, and here we can observe that it's not possible to decode the MIF, the master information block, and we have uh, the cell ID, the wrong cell ID display. So um, let me just go through some key points. Uh, research um, shows that it is possible to interfere with synchronization signals using MBIOT devices to establish communication with the NLB. Therefore, a simple selective device can prevent complete communication of MBIOT devices. And our experiments indicate that carefully designed uh, of the interference signal might able to an attacker to force the UE to recognize a specific narrow physical, um, narrowband physical cell ID. Into, um, also in, in our, our next steps, we plan to analyze, uh, and we are analyzing how to this, and to make this jamming signal to be designed uh, to make an spoofing attack, uh, an spoofing attack. And we are currently investigating in the methods to detect the jamming of synchronization control and reference signals and make the detection and the prevention mechanisms uh, more robust. Uh, so that's the end of my presentation. If you have any question, I will be happy to answer. Thanks for your attention. So we will have the questions at the end for all the speakers. And now I would like to invite our next speaker. I don't think uh, Mary is with us today. Uh, so we will invite Nadia to present her uh, talk. Uh, and if uh, Mary joined, then she can maybe at the end after Sumia, she can join. Please, Nadia. Yes, Gabriela, can you please stop sharing so I can share my screen? Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yeah, good. Uh, thank you for, well, before starting, I would like to thank you for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to be here with you today to present my work on an assistant robot ontology based vision and fission engine. So, the agenda that I will be following today, I will start by presenting myself and then go through an introduction to introduce the topic and then give um, the aim of the project, um, the problems faced and the solutions. And then I will show and um, present the architecture um, that was designed to, uh, the, uh, to facilitate the interaction between a robot and a um, uh, person that using the robot. I will show the results and then um, end my presentation with questions and answers. So starting by um, presenting, oh, sorry. Just share again. So I am a lecturer in um, Triple E at the University of West London. I have started working then around um, uh, one year ago. Before that, I did a PhD in robotics, uh, which was a joint PhD between the University of uh, um, Hawaii Boumediene in Algiers and the University of Versailles Saint Quentin en Yvelines in Paris. I also have a master's in robotic and um, a degree in engineering um, in control and automation from the University of Algiers. And I am also a member of IET. So human generally um, interact with each other by using natural communication skills such as speech and uh, gesture. They communicate with each other, with their environment using those natural communication skills. So um, the the idea behind this project was to use these natural skills to communicate with machines. As such, for this project was um, a robot, which is a wheelchair um, with, a manip uh, with a robotic arm. To, uh, to be able to do this, um, apply natural skills, we thought about applying multimodal interaction applications. Why multimodal? Because multimodal offers better flexibility and reliability comparing to unimodal applications. And it also make, uh, make it easier 
to interpret information from the uh, different uh, sensors used and the different um, channels that um, help communication between the uh, different um, data and environment. So the aims of the projects, um, are, we have five aims actually. The first one was to think about a solution to make the human machine interaction easier, to help people interact with machine using the natural communication um, ways. So by, by saying that, building a smart system that will combine a fusion and a fission engine to make the communication um, as easier as possible. The second aim was to find a way to uh, represent the environment in a semantic way. By saying semantic representation, I mean that um, defining all the relationship between the entities of the, of the system and all the um, entities of the environment. The third aim was to find a common representation that can be used to exchange data. But by common representation, I mean um, a common way for the user and the machine to understand uh, comments and to understand um, data in similar way. The four aim was to find um, an, a way to define the, the, the environment, all the data that compose the um, system. By saying system, I mean the environment, the user, the robotic, everything that is composed in that system. To this aim, we decided to use the ontology as a knowledge base. And then finally, the final aim was to validate, of, of obviously, the system, the, the proposed architecture. And, and to this end, I have used color petri nets uh, with the two CPN tools. So the first problem faced when starting this um, uh, work was to find a way to represent the modalities and the context in a way that will be able to be um, managed by our architecture. And to do that, we, I thought about uh, building a knowledge base. This knowledge bit will include all the elements of the des desired environment and all the relationship between them. This is where we, the ontology steps in, because the ontology helps to create the relationship between all the elements in a, an easy way. That's why the ontology was used as a knowledge base and is a solution to the problem of how to represent modalities. The second problem was to how to make sure that our robot, our system, our machine will understand the user's request. When, when people communicate with each other, for example, now when I'm using my voice, you are all understanding me naturally. But if I use my voice with a machine, with a robot, how can I make sure that this robot will understand me the way I want it to understand me. For this reason, I have um, decided to use, uh, well, to merge information, the input information. Merging means that we need to combine all the data from the input, combine the um, comment, the um, request, combine the, the information from the environment, from the sensors, and merge them. Um, the solution for that was to use a rule-based fission engine. I will go further in details when I, uh, in a few uh, slides. Um, another problem was now that this system has been to understand, has been, uh, is able to understand the request and understand the way uh, the user is communicating with it. How will the system re answer this request? This um, problem was um, solved by finding a way to send subtasks or task to output modality to be able to um, answer the user's request. To this end, a rule-based fission engine here steps in where the fission engine will look at the result from the fish, fusion engine, sorry, and subdivide um, the result into subtasks that will be sent to output modalities. Output modalities could be actuators, for example, or um, a screen and um, whatever is defined in your system. And here I'm sharing with you a general representation of the architecture. You can see that the system is uh, connected in a very, um, well, not simple, but in a very logical way, where you have input modalities here and you have output modalities here that are connected um, um, through the environment, a loop that will always come back to the input. So the MSA, which stands for uh, Multimodal System Architecture, is composed of four parts. 
The four, first one is the input modality selection that will receive input from the uh, modalities that are used to uh, interact with the system. When received, the information the data received from this will be sent to Vision Engine, where the system will understand the comment, decide which model to, to use, and send that um, information to the Fission Engine. The Fission Engine will decide how to subdivide um, the information and send them into unimodal tasks to output modalities to, to answer the user's request. The user in this um, uh, example here is using a wheelchair with a robotic arm. As you can see all, also that the knowledge page, which is the ontology where everything is defined, when I say everything is all the entities from the environment, all the rules and everything are always continuously sharing data with the MSA to uh, make sure that the environment is always uh, up to date. The MSA is always up to date with what is happening around it. So what is the ontology? Why did I deciding to use an ontology at, as a knowledge base? An ontology is mainly used to model the knowledge domain um, by defining all the entities of the domain of the environment and also defining all the relationship between them. When I say that, for example, when I say uh, I ask or I tell a friend, call my sister, you will definitely know who is my sister and how to call her. But when I want to ask a robot or a machine to call my sister, the robot needs to understand who is my sister, what call means, and how to find the number of my sister to be able to call her. So the ontology will be the place where all these entities and the relationship are defined. They are described using um, classes, which will uh, form the overall ontology, attributes which are properties that link uh, different classes and also relationship, which will be uh, what are the relationship between the different members of the classes that are forming the entire uh, ontology. Here I give you um, an example of uh, classes. You can see here that I have a class on environment that has different subclasses connected to it. All this is defined in the ont ontology. For instance, if I take an example of the context, which is a subclass of environment, you can see here that the context also is have different subclasses. For instance, the user constant context, sorry, where you have the different information about the user's handicap type, for example, or the user information. Here I said handicap type because obviously uh, this application is going to be used for the uh, purpose of helping a wheelchair user. So it's mainly to be able to um, know what is the um, type of handicap the user is suffering from. Um, for example, the health or the system context, let's say the health context is where you are uh, having your senses that will provide different uh, data, for instance, blood pressure, and everything is connected within the ontology. Here we are moving to another type of connections in the ontology where you are providing um, properties or that help to connect different uh, members of the ontology. As such, I started by um, providing an example of the environment context where you have the lightning level. The lightning level is where the sensors that will be uh, detecting the light level in the room or wherever the machine is, going to sense the data, um, the light level, sorry. And this is, Obviously, you can see here that, for example, the screen is connected to the lightning level. Why is it connected? Because the screen will be um, affected by the lightning level. That's why it has been, um, uh, how to say, it, but has been connected or properties that links the screen to the light, lightning level because the screen is affected by the lightning level. If it's too dark, if it's too bright, that might be difficult maybe to look at the screen. So the, all, this, all this information has to be defined in the ontology, where, which is the knowledge base of the system. And the um, system will always refer to it at an, um, any time to define and to decide what, how to answer the user's request. So um, as such, why the ontology is very um, useful in this scenario? Because it gives accurate overview of the user environment. Why it gives it accurate? Because 
you can, by using ontology, you can define the environment in details. You can define all the elements, all the relationships, everything that is composed in that environment is accessible through the ontology. It also allows the openness of the system. Openness means that you can add at any time any um, more data, any more information. You can retrieve information. If the context changes, you can delete things and so on. It also helps, uh, gives the opportunity to define the relationship by using properties as such, as I was explaining before, for the um, example of calling my sister. Uh, when I say my sister, you obviously know who is my sister, but a machine needs to understand that this person is my sister and the ontology gives the op op option to define this um, different relationship by using properties. And finally, the semantic relations, where you are defining all the semantic um, properties of the system and how they are defined in, for example, when I was saying the screen is um, uh, affected by the lightning level or if the speaker is affected by the noise level, all this can be defined in the ontology. So you have like a very much a complex uh, relationship defined in ontology. It's like a net of relationships. Here I will be now moving to modality selections. Um, modalities are used as inputs and outputs. When I say modalities, it can be like, for example, when I'm using my uh, voice or to, to ask, request the machine to move from a room to another, this can be uh, considered as a modality. When selecting a modality, we need to look at the available ones according to the context state. For instance, if you are, um, in a noisy environment, it would be better for the system not to choose to use the speaker to answer their um, user's request and choose another output modality. For this um, end, the um, software protege was used, which helps integrating rules and queries using Swirl and uh, <coughs> sorry, Square. This is an example of, um, uh, sorry, um, <coughs> recovering from a very bad cough. So here you have the input modality. It's check which input modality was um, detected. Is it affected by the noise, noise or not? Is the noise greater than 60? If yes, what will happen? So I will show you, share with you this um, screen here. As I said before, we have the voice sensor, which will detect that you are, uh, for example, asking for um, uh, location or uh, something that you need on uh, by, by using a voice and then the noise actually is 74 which is greater than the 60 predefined in your ontology as such you can see that the ontology the system will decide that the speaker as an output system is not the best um, output modality to be used because of the level noise level so the available will be these four that are available as an output Obviously, if you are requesting, for example, a phone number, again, you can use the ski. The system will use screen as a best output modality. I'm aware of the time, so I will be, I'll speed a little bit my presentation. Now I will move, move to the fusion in G. The fusion is where you're going to merge all the input informations. The fusion engine is um, uh, following the WWHT uh, model for multimodal um, combination and interaction, you need to answer four questions. The what question will be to look at what has the system detected. Obviously here is the input modality, which will look at which uh, model of the fusion engine uh, to um, use to merge information. How is to uh, use those model to uh, combine the information from the different inputs and then send the results to the fusion engine. We have defined 19 models. Each model is a combination of classes that are um, defined in the ontology, connected with object properties. For example, for the give me cup, when the user is asking to for a cup, the system will be able to recognize each word, recognize the um, time at each word was um, uh, acquired or detected, and then decide which model to follow and send this model to them fission engine. For example, here, take me there, another example. The in ontology has detected, or the system has detected take first, me second, there. 
and they have been um <coughs> sorry detected as having a property has next four which is the model four of the fusion engine that's as such the system um the architecture or the system will choose use this model to merge information now that the system has um, understood how to merge information and has actually combined the input information how to now send this to the system and um, the system when i say for example take me there the system will need to understand take me and there but also understand that the system needs to move from this position to the other position where i am pointing for instance if i'm using the gesture to, to this end, the fission engine will again uh, has uh, has to answer four questions. For the what question, um, we look at what the fusion engine has um, uh, created, which solution to use, and then uh, subdivide this uh, action into unimodal tasks that will be sent to the output modalities to answer the user's request. Here we have nine solutions. Again, that the solutions comparing to the uh, fusion uh, engines to the same thing where you have a combination of different classes of the ontology that are um, connected through object properties to answer the user's request so the validation is a part an important part of system uh, building because it's give you the um, uh, will help you to validate your system up validate your approach this model so far we, that I was presenting is the model of a robotic environment that integrates the ontology as a knowledge base and also uses very two very important parts, which are the fusion to merge information and then the fission indeed, will, which will subdivide the information and send them to the output actuators to answer the user request. So it's very important to validate this approach to show that this approach will really the system when we are going to integrate it into a robotic application our system will really understand what i am asking for and the system will answer in a way um, in a correct way to say it um straightforward so as i presented um, earlier the ontology formalism helps to verify the consistency of the knowledge representation or the information relationship of the environment uh, I use Protege, which is an um, open source uh, software for real robotics application, which helps, helped me to um, build the rules for the fusion and fission engines. For the validation, I used PetriNets uh, using the app, uh, software CPN tools. Why PetriNets? Because PetriNets help the model modeling the systems in a time uh, using uh, so following some uh, laws of probability. I will explain further when I give you examples. And helps execute the application in several scenarios of several uh, different models. For example, I give an example of a model and um, uh, by simulation, it will be generated randomly following uh, different uh, laws of probability. And this will help to validate our system. So this is an um, um, example, or well, I'm sharing with you my screen here. You can see, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, the CPN tools uh, PetriNet that was uh, generated on CPN tools to validate our system. You can see that here we have generated different um, input data for different comments bring ding give with um, things that have no sense in the middle just to make sure that the architecture will um how the architecture will behave when you have a correct um request and when there is a mistake in the uh, in the um, uh, request how the system will be able to understand that this request is a genuine request and answer it and when the um, uh, request is a, a mistake maybe by the user or it does not make sense how to reject it so here i show you the complexity actually of the um, validation that where you have all the different rules all the different parts of the ontology i'm not going to go in details because i'm aware of the time so but basically this is um, exactly what we've done with the approach that ontology, but we applied it in here to be able to validate our system and um, see how the 
a system will react when receiving a request from the user. As you can see on this uh, screen here, when uh, launching the uh, simulation, we have different inputs. They are just words, random words that might, if combining, make sense, or when combining, they might also not make any sense. We did this in purpose to see how the system will uh, interpret the input. For instance, for bring me cup of juice, what needs to be done by the system? It needs to understand what bring means, me means, cup mean, juice mean, and then locate each word in the ontology and how this relationship is, um, how they are connected with the properties. When the system will understand this um, request, he will need to send uh, actions to the uh, output, to the um, robotic wheelchair, for instance, moving, um, moving to a position of the cup, take the cup, um, pour the juice in this, and all this step by step that are obvious for a human, but for machine, we need to tell them step by step. And you can see here that our architecture was able to do it. So if I go to um, some statistics of the results, um, when we were generating random uh, uh, inputs, how, this is shows you the grid of how many times each um, uh, word has been generated. The total was 99 words, uh, combinations and 33 examples. The, the system was able to accept 11 examples, which means that the system was able to recognize um, correct uh, input, correct uh, requests, whereas rejected different one because either the vocabulary was not correct. For example, if I sing bring me there or uh, give me there, which does not, does not make any sense. So the system was able to reject that comment and explain why it was rejected. For example, seven one was rejected because of the vocabulary combination was not something defined in the system, so it was not recognized. Three was um, rejected because the comment was not uh, as defined in the system and so on. So as a conclusion, we can talk, um, this um, slide is showing you the main idea behind our system. So our environment, which could, uh, in this example was a robotic wheelchair, but it could be also applied to any other um, environment that it has a combination of people, mobile, ro other robotics <coughs> applications, and that are always uh, connected to the ontology via agents that, and that will help the environment to be always aware of what's going on around it. So as a conclusion, I will, um, uh, uh, sorry, as a conclusion, the system makes the interaction easier. Why it's easier? Because this, the person using our robotic wheelchair, using this uh, approach, architectural approach, will use their natural communication means as they are using with other people around them to communicate with the robot. And the robot will answer exactly how, uh, what the user is um, uh, requesting. The ontology uh, was used as a knowledge base, successfully used as a knowledge base to fully describe the environment where the machine and the human are uh, evaluate, um, uh, located, sorry. And also assure, assures a common understanding of the entity between them uh, machine and the human. And finally, uh, we have successfully used PetriNet to validate our system by recognizing different inputs, recognizing which the input was a genuine uh, request and which inputs were um, obviously um, did not make any sense. So they were rejected and why they were rejected. And if you have any questions, I will be very happy to answer them at the end of the session. And I will pass now to uh, Sa Sami Samia, sorry if I'm uh, pronouncing uh, incorrectly your name. Thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you, Nadia. Right, so it's uh, really good to be here, uh, first of all, and uh, Gabriela and Nadia have done some brilliant uh, presentations as well, really nice to hear from you. Um, so I'll share my screen now and then take you through um, what I have to say. So um, what I'll be presenting to you today is something um, 
slightly different, but similar to what Nadia had to say in terms of machine vision. Uh, it will be image processing. Uh, let me share my, yeah. So uh, my uh, area of uh, uh, research is image analysis and feature extraction. Uh, we are basically concentrating on pathological disease diagnosis. So it is different to um, uh, robotics and other, uh, other areas, not exactly different robotics to image processing, but I'm uh, going to present a cross-disciplinary uh, area, an interdisciplinary area, which includes engineering solutions to uh, biological problems. So it's basically medical imaging. Um, so I'll start with a little bit about me. Uh, my name is uh, Saumya Karim Reni. I am um, a senior lecturer at the University of Westminster, uh, Department of Computer Science and Engineering. I am also a research fellow at Applied DSP and VLSI Research Group. Um, and my back background is biomedical engineering and uh, done post graduation in system on chip design for DSP and communications. And then my PhD is in image processing for biomedical application. Uh, at the moment, I am the director of studies for PhD studentship. Uh, we have, uh, I have at the moment two students under me, um, and uh, I'm also the assistant secretary of IEEE UK and Ireland section. Uh, also the delegate of uh, women in STEM. Uh, I've, I've been the ambassador of women in STEM by the Department of Engineering at University of Westminster. Also a member of IEEE and um, IET. And I'm also a technical committee member and reviewer of a number of publications, including um, ICTH and uh, ISCUS. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, we'll move on to the uh, problem here, and uh, hopefully I can entertain you with some of the images rather than <laughs> um, uh, some uh, words actually here, uh, because um, I am basically dealing with images, medical images. And when we talk about medical images, we will think about MRI, CT, and um, um, X-ray images. But what I'm going to show is something different. And um, let me just quickly um, go to that. Um, yeah, what I'm going to show is uh, these two images, which is uh, completely different from the medical images that we are usually used to. And these are pathological images. Okay, so that's what uh, my talk is today about. Now, going back to um, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk, uh, first of all, introducing you to the images uh, to get your attention, in fact, and then we'll talk about certain case studies that we came across during our span of our research, um, uh, some cases that we worked with, and then um, we'll move on to the final section. Now, um, Regarding a little bit about our research group, Applied DSP and VLSI Research Group, that's where uh, we are doing all this work. Uh, it is at University of Westminster, and it is under uh, working under the supervision of Professor Izzat Kale, who is the uh, chair of IEEE and UK, I, IEEE UK and Ireland section. Um, under uh, Professor Izzat, we have done a um, number of uh, pathological image analysis work since uh, early 2000s, actually. Uh, we started with uh, working with analysis of uh, blood from animals, including rats, and then we moved on to humans uh, eventually. Um, so at the moment, we have um, our latest achievement is, amongst others, our latest achievement is the uh, pathological or uh, microscopic image analysis for uh, parasite identification, for disease identification, particularly malaria where we had uh, presented our work in uh, numerous uh, places, including the British Society for Parasitology. And uh, we are actively uh, conducting research uh, with, uh, in collaboration with uh, University College London Hospital on Cater Cats images, uh, which deals with neglected tropical disease diagnosis. So that's a bit of an introduction regarding us. <clears throat> now I'll go back to the good old images that I showed you in the beginning. So this is what we have to deal with. And uh, there is something very interesting that Nadia said uh, initially, that uh, us as humans uh, have good processing capabilities. Our, uh, we hear things, we can, we can process our hearing and we can process those uh, words. We can see things and process very easily. But to tell a machine to do that is where the challenge lies. And we are being um, introduced with these kind of images and they are not normal images, they are images taken through a microscope. So we place the camera at the objective of the microscope and just as we look through the microscope, 
the camera take pictures. So um, these are two different images that we get to deal with. Uh, one is our human blood. The image number one, which I'm pointing at the moment, is um, a blood image. It's our human blood which is infected with uh, some parasites. So we'll get into uh, details of that. But as you can see, this darker uh, uh, objects that you can see are the parasites. Whereas we get another set of image, which is a second one, um, and that is much more angrier in, in our words. Okay, have, that's much more spurious. And that is because um, the background is not as uniform as uh, what we see in um, our first image. Now, uh, not only the background, what we see as oval shaped or equipped objects are our culprits, and we need to automatically diagnose. Anybody uh, in their right mind would say, oh, it is easy because it's easily visualized. So it should be easy for the machine to interpret, but we, uh, to be honest, we have been working on it and we can say that it's not always, and uh, my apologies, always an easy task. So uh, moving on into the details, our first uh, research study, case study that I would like to present is the uh, first image, which I was talking about, the malaria diagnosis. Um, so uh, for malaria diagnosis, this is uh, what we need to go through. We have to um, detect the darker object, which in, 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 uh, in the normal way is easy, should be easy. But what we are facing with is the components like this, which are outside um this area the area that you see here and i don't think any one of us are uh, experts in um parasitology but uh, i should i should uh, we can we can uh, easily say that uh, from the training that we had this is the rbc which carry human um uh, which carries oxygen oxygen to all part of our body uh, the ones which i am pointing at the moment they are the red blood cells they are the important ones now the parasites hide inside the red blood cells. So it is easy, it is not easy for the white blood cell, which attack our human, uh, attack any foreign bodies to um, identify and kill them. <clears throat> so in the, <clears throat> we are in the era of uh, pandemic. So these are all very relevant to us. We understand that when a foreign body enters, our body should fight against it. And based on our immunity, we will be a more uh, sick or uh, less. Now in this case, our, Immune, immune system cannot identify it because they are hiding inside the RBC. So the object identification in machine vision that which we are going through, we need to look for objects uh, in the form of RBCs. And then we have to go inside that and look for the darker components. So the problem is not that easy to just straight away look for darker components because there are certain objects like this, which is outside the RBCs. So these objects are outside the RBCs and they are difficult to uh, remove. Because if you are removing these objects, which, if you are telling the machine to remove small circular object, which is darker in color, it's going to remove the good ones as well. So that, that's, that's where the uh, problem lies. And there are other issues that we faced as well. Um, so once we successfully identified the infected cells, we need to then estimate the level of infection like how much this person is infected with malaria, which is a indication of infected cell, a ratio of infected cell to total number of cells. So it is crucial for us to not only identify the parasites, but to identify all the red blood cells which contain the parasites in order to get a level of infection or diagnostic probabilities. So keeping that in mind, this is just an introduction of the problem that we usually face. These are the steps that we needed to take care of. Platelet artifact removal, which is the small object removal, then foreground object identification, then there is a red blood cell identification, white blood cell identification, then infected cell identification, and finally, life stage recognition. So these are the stages that we had to follow. I wouldn't bore you with a lot of details, but I'll get you certain interesting aspects. This was our journey towards uh, a four-year journey, actually, to be honest, to go around and get a successful object identification tool, which is an automated system. We were trying to go against the pathologist and say that we can do uh, 
we were, we wouldn't dare to say we can do better than uh, you. We, in, in our mind, we wanted to say, yeah, we can do better than you, but um, we are going to replace your jobs. That was the whole idea. Because if we give our blood to the pathologist, if we send our blood uh, to the laboratories, it takes two weeks to get a diagnosis. Our aim was to get it in seconds. That was the aim and in a portable manner. So that was what we were actually going uh, through. Okay. So um, we had initial stages, which uh, it, like any uh, measuring vision, we were uh, concerned about the quality of the images. Whether are we getting the best images possible, the higher contrast, high resolution, non-uniform illumination, uh, are we getting that? And then later we uh, decided that, okay, we don't have to worry about uh, the type of images that we are getting because no matter what image we get, we need to get a diagnosis. That was our aim in the end. It was ambitious, but we eventually get to that, got to that, uh, because malaria is um, endemic in regions uh, which are in the developing or underdeveloped countries. And we cannot expect them to have uh, a high uh, image acquisition setup to get properly good uh, images. So we, it will be uh, too greedy for us to think that we are going to get the best image possible. No, the, our, our clientele or our, our user requirement demands that this has to be used as a mass monitoring tool. This has to be used as a, a laboratory tool where we cannot uh, have all the facilities possible. We are not always in the developed nations to get that. So keeping that in mind, we thought we will develop a novel system which is uh, robust to or insensitive to any problems with the images, it should still be able to uh, get to the object identification level. Now, um, size of the cell is one parameter that we, uh, we just checked, and then staining, because the intensity in image processing is the most important aspect. So with that in mind, uh, we started, but then we had some obstacles, as the heading says. Uh, and the major obstacles were uh, other components in the blood. For example, if you see the first two images, uh, this and this one, um, what you see here is of the same morphology as what you see here. But our problem was they are both different objects. One is a white blood cell, which works, for, works with our human um, immune system. Whereas the second one, which is of same um, distinctive shape, because machine, we tell the machine to look for distinctive shapes for the parasite. And this is a gametocyte of a malaria parasite, which is the advanced stage, which is a sexual. Uh, um, until uh, three stages, they are asexual, and then they um, become gametes, and they are uh, uh, sexual parasites. And uh, they form this shape. So. Morphology and uh, going for the correct morphology was difficult. And as you can see, the cells were so plumped up that segmentation is going to be a big problem because ultimately we need to count all the red blood cells present. And if they are overlapped like this, that make our life uh, so difficult. So is this, this is a poorly illuminated image. We can hardly see anything apart from the parasites. So there also we had to, uh, we had, we faced some issues. Whereas the, um, the lower uh, quarter images that I have shown, uh, um, third and fourth one, they have easily distinguishable RBCs. But then again, this object here is similar to what we see here. And this is again a white blood cell, WBC, and this is actually a parasite. So uh, how do we actually tell the machine to you know, discard a white blood cell and uh, take, a, take off a parasite. That was the major challenge that we had to face. Um, that, that, that is when we appreciate our human eye, how well it distinguish, um, sorry, I'm just trying to connect my um, writing padlet. Uh, so that's where we had the, uh, that's where we realized that our human eye is really uh, um, um, crude and our brain, Processing power is really good to distinguish this one. Once we are, once we get the knowledge, it's easy to distinguish, and that's the advantage for path, uh, path, uh, pathologists. But if we are planning to automate, and if we are going against the gold standard of manual microscopy, we need to address these problems. Now, um, again, 
the type of images that you're going to get. That, are, that is another set of obstacles that we have to face. There are different types of images, different background, different um, structure, different size of the objects. And obviously the nasty ones such as the uh, clumped up RBCs, these were all the problems that we had to face during the course of uh, this work. Okay, and um, with that in mind, we started, we started and uh, just like any image processing um, um, beginners, we started with image analysis. We try to understand the nature of the image and we started with histogram. And we wanted to see in histogram um, the peaks because each peak tells us a story. For example, the peak over here, this is the background. This is about the background. And the peak over here tells us about RBC because it is about the intensities. The light colored uh, is under the region of 255, actually. If I zoom in, it goes up to 255. And dark color is represented between 0 to 100. So we can see smaller peaks here and a little bit over here. And we assume that those smaller peaks are, uh, peaks are down to the dark objects, which is the uh, small sized dark objects, which are these ones, uh, the dotted ones. So from that, we had some idea about uh, the nature of the image to move forward. Now, um, okay. So we did some morphological filtering. We started off with morphological image processing because other uh, spatial filters such as median, Wiener filter, Gaussian uh, smoothing, they all took away information. Now you might think, okay, the morphological operation that I that we performed also took away information. Yes, it took away information, but it retained the major information that we needed, which is RBCs. So after performing a morphological closing operation, which deals with morphological dilation followed by morphological erosion, which means uh, dilation takes away darker components in the uh, in the image, which means all this uh, darker component, like everything which is pertaining to our uh, image, this ones and this ones were removed using morphological erosion or dilation, and then to uh, reconstruct the size of the RBCs, we did morphological dilation. So overall, we did morphological filtering operations to remove unwanted. Uh, platelets. Platelets is what we call uh, the small uh, component that we see here. These are all platelets. We use morphological filtering to remove them, but at the same time, it also removed all the necessary information that we needed. But we were, at this stage, we were happy to, uh, um, you know, bear that casualty because we were, we were getting on to something. And then we did a novel algorithm as part of the research which was called annular ring ratio uh, transform, uh, which transformed the given morphologically closed image to something in a ratio intensity platform. It takes the ratio of two different platforms um, chosen by a structuring element or a kernel in the, in the world of image processing, we call it kernel or structuring element, which chooses um, an outer region of the RBC, including its edge and the inner region, which gives a peak similar to this. So each peak in here are locations of RBCs. And once we finalized from this image, the locations of RBCs, we then went inside those locations and we looked for darker components. So we used the same algorithm inside each RBC. So we were, we, were plan we were working under two different platforms. The first one was an entire image where the foreground object is the RBC. Once we located the RBC, we traveled to each location and used RBCs as background and looked for dark color component. So, which means after, once we are in this stage, we got the location, then we went back to the old grayscale image, went into each location and look for a darker component using the same annular ring ratio method. So that's the method we used. Um, it was uh, it, it needed a lot of, uh, for example, training to get to that stage. Uh, at the moment, I'm just saying this as a, as a uh, uh, 
as a simple step, but it was it wasn't that easy. Uh, kindly bear with me. I need to. Uh, I think my laptop is running out of charge. Sorry about that. Sorry about the interruption. So eventually, we get to identify all the um, RBCs and WBCs. This is another set of image where a WBC is present, and we get to identify those WBCs. Once we have that information, we went to each uh, location and then identified which of them are infected. And uh, we leave the uh, healthy cells intact. We only mark the infected cells. It is an automated process, again, with the same analog ratio transform. So that was how we come across uh, each images and uh, get to the um, final uh, set. Once we have the infected cell, we then calculate the total number of infected cells divided by the total number of RBCs to calculate the parasitemia. We develop a user interface uh, with certain functionalities involved. You know, the interface will tell us the total number of red blood cells, white blood cells, infected cells, and the total parasitemia in that case. It also took us to different stages of image processing, scale conversion, ratio transform, and um, dilation and closing. It also went ahead and identified the life stages. For example, each malaria parasite has distinctive shape distinctive stages. The initial stage is a ring. Uh, so these are initial stages, which has only one dot. But as it multiplies and grow, this is the second stage, the trizon stage, where it has more nucleus. They multiply within the RBCs. They are actually killing the RBCs. And those who have malaria eventually become anemic because it doesn't carry a lot of blood. The RBCs are not good enough to carry any blood anymore. So it is actually killing the RBC. So we get to the life stages because life stages are important for a person to be treated because malaria uh, medication depends on our treatment strategies, depends on which level of infection that is. So we have uh, successfully uh, done that as well and uh, followed by um, parasitemia detection. Um, so that was the whole uh, case study one, which involves uh, malaria parasite and images containing malaria parasites. Uh, we, we have done the same for all the other images that you have seen. Um, and the annular ring ratio method is um, relative to uh, images because it checks for the ratio corresponding to that particular image. So it can balance with any image that we get, even though the illumination has issues because we are taking the ratio, which cancels out like a um, differential amplified, cancels out any common issues present. Then we had a couple of case studies we came across uh, while doing the malaria parasite detection. And one of them were how to identify um, the gametocytes. Gametocyte, for example, in malaria has a different uh, morphology than the other stages. For example, uh, the ring trophocyte and trophocyte and schizone stage, they are completely different to the sexual stage, which is a gametocyte. Now, once we are diagnosed with malaria, we have the medication for malaria. Then um, the doctors do a post-treatment uh, diagnosis. So they go through our blood after the malaria treatment. And what happens is, we, uh, we will be surprised to hear that these particular gametocytes are um, resistant to malaria uh, uh, drugs. They are resistant to malaria drugs so they will still be present in the blood. They will not cause any um, symptoms. We won't have fever like we normally see with malaria. Malaria is caused by Plasmodium species um, and Anopheles female, Anopheles mosquito causes it. Uh, so mosquitoes, uh, they feed on a person with uh, malaria. And what they do is the mosquitoes then carry the uh, gametes. They carry this. And then they go and sit with sit in other person for a blood meal and inject the gametocyte into the bloodstream of the next person. And then these gametocytes go to the liver where it start uh, multiplying. So uh, the mosquitoes actually pick up only the gametocyte. It will not pick up any other life stages. And even though gametocyte will not cause any symptoms for us, any discomfort for us, it is the core reason behind 
the transmission of malaria. So it is extremely important that we detect these gametocytes as well. Um, we have to detect them even after the treatment of malaria because they are resistant to malaria parasite, malaria drugs. So we did uh, certain, we took certain images and we worked with them, which only has uh, gametocytes in it. We did everything we did in the previous stages, including morphological closing. Then we uh, went ahead and did uh, annular ring ratio, detected the uh, cells. We went inside the cell. We divided the cell to four quadrants and started taking the variance and standard deviation of each quadrant. Any uh, healthy cell will have very low standard deviation and variance, whereas any cell with parasites present will have a larger variance and standard deviation. So that easily distinguish a healthy cell from uh, an infected cell. But then the problem was, if we go to the white blood cell, which has this, almost the same size, and if I divide into four quadrants, its variance and standard deviation matches with that of the uh, infected ones. So what we then did was, we did a localized uh, average calculation, and the average of white blood cells are way lesser than the average intensity value of an infected cell. So that was the object identification strategy that we used to distinguish between a white blood cell and a, a parasite. And uh, we didn't have a lot of images to work with, and obviously it is kind of like a machine learning process. We need to teach the machine and train the machine, so we artificially copied and pasted different types of white blood cells into the blood. As you can see, they're not, we, you can still see a little bit of edge because we copied and pasted it for uh, practice purposes. And we wanted uh, to detect this particular uh, uh, parasite compared to the others. And uh, the system was successful in identifying uh, this parasite compared to the rest of the WBC purely because of the novel algorithm that we developed. So this was one of the case study that we came across. We also went ahead to get as many images as possible. And one of the interesting ones that we received were fluorescent images from Pondicherry Medical Institute in India. They sent fluorescent images where fluorescent dyes are used. Um, and uh, these dyes will highlight the nucleic acid uh, present. And uh, uh, malaria parasite also causes pigmentation. So as you could see, this is obviously a schizon stage of malaria. This is a ring trophozoite, and this is also a trophozoite phase of malaria parasite. Whereas you can see another one here, which is outside the RBC, even though it's not very clearly visible, uh, the machine was successful enough to uh, identify them. We use the same annular ring ratio transform here as well. However, uh, we didn't do morphological closing in this operation because Fluorescent images, when converted to grayscale, were actually really good. It is like nicely processed. So we didn't have to, we could uh, skip one step. Now, having done all of these steps, it took us less than 20 seconds to do a diagnosis. As soon as we feed in an image, it will tell in within 20 seconds, that was uh, that is with a, with a normal spec PC. And if you have high processing uh, processor gaming laptops, it is even more, uh, even faster than um, 20 seconds, uh, which was the highlight of our work. And based on that, we did some diagnostic probabilities, which is what the pathologists, because we presented it at uh, British Society for Parasitology, and they were like very interested. And what they wanted to know is, can it be, can it come close to manual microscopy? Obviously, we cannot replace humans uh, to an extent, especially with uh, imaging and uh, similar stuff, especially with medical images. We can't take that chance, but can they use this as an academic and monitoring tool? And we were quite successful to get 96% accuracy because we have a very high sensitivity and specificity rate. Now, those who are not aware of sensitivity and specificity, sensitivity is... Uh, if you have an infection, you go to the doctor, how well the doctor say, okay, you are sick. You are actually sick, but what if the doctor say you are not sick? Um, that, is, that, is, that is the problem here. So sensitivity is if you are, if you have a disease, will the system detect it? And we have 93.4% uh, sensitivity in that case. Another important problem is specificity. 
That means if you don't have a disease, how would you feel if you were told, okay, you are not well? That is also another problem. If you are healthy, the systems should say you are healthy. And we got 96.4% uh, specificity, which tells if somebody is not sick, the system will say with 96.4% accuracy that they are not um, uh, sick. And the total accuracy came up to 96%. That was our diagnostic probability. So uh, that was our successful completion for malaria parasite detection. And we were hungry for more uh, similar uh, because interdisciplinary researchers are really good in terms of uh, contribution to the field. So uh, we have few research outcomes, outcomes both in engineering field and uh, medical field, which means we did a morphological pre-filtering uh, in the engineering side of things, uh, facilitate cell isolation. Uh, locating RBCs and WBCs uh, are really important in the subsection in the medical field, not just for malaria parasite, but if you have a blood image, the system can locate and um, identify red blood cells and white blood cells. Detection of infection with RBCs, we can uh, recognize the plasmodium species. We can also recognize the gametocyte uh, for post-treatment diagnosis. Uh, we've done uh, fluorescent image analysis. We have contributed our annular ring ratio method to the field, which is significant and rigorous in terms of a novel image processing algorithm. We also developed a mobile-based application tool for diagnosis, which is portable, which can be carried to the countries where they have good connectivity. Um, and we have been awarded thematic grants based on that. We have presented our work in Pathology Visions Conference and uh, British Society for Parasitology which we are really happy about. Um, now, at the moment, we are uh, working at a different set of image, which is also microscopic image, but you wouldn't believe uh, what it is. It is not blood image, but it is the image of human stool, which contains eggs, which carries infection. So those images are called Cato cats images, and the uh, circular objects that we see are parasitic eggs, uh, which causes neglected tropical diseases. They are called neglected tropical diseases because they are very fatal disease. They are dangerous diseases, but they are neglected because they are not malaria or tuberculosis. So already the underdeveloped countries are tackling a big uh, problem with malaria and tuberculosis. That they don't have enough resources or the money to do uh, work on neglected tropical diseases. And we have taken upon that work at the moment. As you can see, histogram is not as clean as we get in malaria uh, diagnosis, but we are working with it. Our strategy in a, in a, in a nutshell is this. We locate uh, the center of these cells, but while doing that, we have so many false positives as well. So once we have uh, the false positive, we go to our good old standard deviation, average and variant uh, methodology to distinguish but we still have some overlap here. And based on that, mm -hmm. we then went ahead and worked with uh, markers, uh, object and, and template matching, and annular ring ratio further to locate exactly uh, the circular object leaving the healthy one behind. So that's our strategy, which is still under process. That's what we are uh, working on at the moment with Cater Cats images. Um, so, in conclusion, uh, what I introduced you is three different case studies on uh, a completely different side of medical imaging, not just MRI and uh, CT and X-ray, but we have an entire field of medical parasitology where um, microscopic images are gaining momentum. There are emerging trends in uh, microscopic image analysis. So we have done a thorough feasibility study on that. We introduced you to this inter interdisciplinary research section. We address the limitations of clinical parasitology, and we have also introduced the results which we think contributes, and we know that it contributes to the field. So with that, I conclude my talk here. Thank you so much for allowing me to present here uh, in this uh, distinguished lecture. Uh, I should thank uh, Nagam and uh, Iman for that. Uh, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer with the rest of the presenters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nima? Yes, thank you so much for all of you. Actually, we, we really 
uh, enjoyed your talks and we benefit from them. So thank you for your time and your effort for these nice presentations. Um, so I'll look for the Q&A uh, chat box. We have two questions here. So one for Gabriel, I think, are you working with OFDM systems? If yes, then why not any other technologies? Yes, we are working on with the orthogonal um, the OFDM um, um, scheme, but uh, for example, the, the NOMA is used for a 5G technologies. And in our case, for example, you can use, you can analyze um, the LTE M or the LTE eight in order to uh, analyze the same uh, attacks uh, to in order to apply to five G, but we are taking specifically this approach because we need to uh, analyze the resource element distribution that, for example, has the e LTE, and we need to analyze the distribution and we are analyzing the resource allocations uh, blocks in order to perform a specific attack in that kind of signals. Um, I'm not sure if the not orthogonal has that that structure uh, for 5G. So maybe if you are looking for an like an, an option for 5G, you can use and you can apply the same techniques that we are using in our current research, but using for example LTEM or LTEA, and um, and that could be an option for IoT networks. And um, that's all. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. So the coming one is for Nadia. Um, so how did you make sure you have defined a comprehensive ontology that includes all info needed in the environment? Thank you very much for this question because actually I did not mention it in my presentation. So thank you for the very good question. Um, obviously we can, we've tried to do it as, uh, define as much as possible to make it comprehensive, but the system itself, when we detect an input that it not, defined in the ontology, we flag this up and ask if this is a genuine or not. And if it's their users, we, the user will um, say yes, for example, this uh, word or comment will be added to the ontology as um, and uh, be defined within the context that it should be defined in. Yeah, I hope this so. answers the question. Yeah, yeah thank I you hope, so much. Yes, so. I hope the audience are satisfied with the answers. I've got a question for Somia also, because I saw a great work happening with the RBC and the WBC, and you you, you actually you produce a, a good system to which we which everyone can use. But what's the next step? Is there any interest from the industry to, to use yes, your system? So Obviously, so we have had some talks with um, industry, um, certain foundation like Collier Foundation who are working in Tango and um, Gambia and um, countries where malaria is a problem. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have been in talks with them. And at the same time, we had uh, our presentation was uh, caught by uh, University College London Hospital mm -hmm. with Professor Peter Kiodini, who, who is the head of parasitology division. They are also working under the COVID uh, protection mm -hmm. unit in UCLH. Mm -hmm. So they are the one who presented us with the K2Cats images to work with. Mm -hmm. So um, we are planning to expand our work as a mass monitoring tool uh, mm -hmm. and yeah. as an academic tool as well. So it can help the clinicians to get remote uh, diagnosis and send to the um, central laboratory where mm -hmm. the um, doctors can see that and then consult with pathologists and finalize their work. Uh, we've been trained by the tropical uh, uh, tropical medicine, such as Center for Tropical Medicine. Uh, so we have shown our work to them as well, and this is exactly what they said. Mm -hmm. It is just that we, including Izzat, we are kind of busy to, you know, uh, move forward with that. But uh, we have at the moment a couple of PhD students who are working vigorously to to yeah. take it forward yeah yeah definitely because we can see what COVID, uh, with COVID, a uh, lot of efforts being all united Absolutely. just to, to to make it happen so i can see that you've got a system which is just ready to to uh, yeah go and benefit to humanity but just yeah. i think as you mentioned yeah that's the plan right yeah. well just to to make it happen yeah. so thank you everyone
Thank you, everyone, for that um, brilliant discussion and the presentation. So I would like to thank our um, speakers for these valuable talks and our audience for the pleasant discussion. Also, I'm very grateful to Professor uh, Izzet Kal, uh, the chair of IEEE United Kingdom and Ireland, for attending our presentation. Uh, also, I'm grateful for our speaker from Ireland, the Gabriella Hello, PhD student, University College Cork, and also our speakers from London, Dr. Nadia DJ, the lecturer from the University of West London, and Dr. Sonia Karim, senior lecturer from the University of Westminster. I would like also to thank uh, the uh, Industrial IoT Research Group at UWL for sponsoring and uh, promoting our related events. Uh, also, I would like to thank the ambassadors who helped in organizing this event, uh, Iman and Uduk. You can see Iman, she already put the, the link yes. in the chat box for the survey, so please uh, uh, try to do it. And if yes. you'd like to receive the e-certificates, please let us know. Uh, uh, last point that I would like to mention uh, is just to, I would like, we're all continuing uh, calling for women in engineering and computing to give technical, inspirational, and empowering session. So hopefully our next uh, early career talks event will be in June this year. Uh, the call will be announced uh, soon uh, with, with the hope of all the IEEE members in the UK and Ireland uh, section. Uh, so please keep your eye out for it. Uh, the program uh, support engineers from academia and or industry who have been in the industry or uh, postgraduate position for less than 10 years. Uh, so before we end this session, it will be great uh, if we can have like a group photo with the audience. So okay. please, we will all try to permit the audience to uh, have their speaker on. Uh, and I will also stop the recording.